thank you so much for leading us in that beautiful time of worship. Uh, when we worship on Sunday mornings, it's a, it's a rehearsal for what we'll do for all of eternity. And so if you were, um, if you were bored during that, then something's kind of broken within us. Uh, we, want to, we want to be people that give God praise and glory and honor uh, no matter what. Uh, so as the offering plates are, are passed here, we're thankful for all that God has given us. Here's one thing about worship. Worship in public always flows out of our worship in private. If it's to be absolutely genuine, beautiful worship, then what we do in, in private um, really validates and makes what we do in public powerful. And just to illustrate that, uh, during our first year of marriage, uh, we uh, worked at a church and one of the staff members invited us over every Wednesday night to dinner at their house and his wife would cook a meal for us and we'd sit around the table and we'd enjoy just the time hanging out together. And then every single week, he would thank his wife by name for the food. It's like, thank you so much for, that was just a beautiful meal and thank you for cooking that. Um, was that a good thing? Um, I mean, she went out of her way to do that, and he would thank her publicly week after week after week. We left um, after about uh, a year and went to seminary. Uh, that's where God had planned for us to go, and, and then uh, found out within, like, weeks or months right after that that they were getting a divorce. The people that we had eaten dinner with just week after week after week. Here is the gist of it. Um, in public... He would say, aren't you a wonderful cook, and didn't you do a good job, and you know, wasn't that a great thing? But in private, his words to her were completely different. And so can you see where um, in public our words are validated by our words that happen in private? And I think of the same way with God. Uh, if the only time we tell God he's a great cook and he's done wonderful things for us is on Sunday morning, then it's no different than that, that what we do in private validates what we do on, in public. And so that it's received so beautifully on Sunday morning when we all come together to worship, uh, uh, together do that uh, because we've been doing it all week long. Uh, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to, if you have to set your alarm, if you have to put in a reminder, if you put something on your steering wheel um, so that you're reminded, just do anything to remind you that you want to give God praise, honor, and glory all week long. Perhaps turn off the radio and just sing your own songs in the car. Uh, maybe the, the first thing that you do before you uh, get out of bed in the morning is just give him honor and glory. Sometimes I'll roll over in bed just so that I'm face down and don't bother my wife on that just I'm face down to where God I just I give everything to you I surrender to you before I get out of the, the get going for the day could you see how we would worship so different um, we wouldn't wait for four songs to warm us up we would be bursting when we come into this place and so that's what we're called to do as a church we're called to worship him in private so that our public worship is so good. Uh, this week uh, is people are going back to school. Kids, going back to school, can you give a cheer, kids? Uh, um, how about parents? Can you give a cheer? Yeah, I knew, I knew that was coming. Way to go. Um, we want to pray for anybody involved in the, in the schools. So if you're a cook, if you're a principal, if you're a teacher, if you're a bus driver, if you stand at the... Um, at the bus stop and pray for kids that are getting on the bus or just make sure. I had a lady in our first uh, town. She would stand there just to make sure they didn't bully any other kids. Like that's, that's somebody that just wants to get involved. Here's an 80-year-old lady that stands at the bus stop morning after morning. Wouldn't that be great? Um, so would you like stand up if you're involved with kids and uh, doing something in the schools with kids? We want to pray for you. So please, I... It's out of, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for what you do. And uh, thank you. Can we pray for them right now? Uh, in fact, 
we're going to pray with our eyes open. We can do that, you know. Um, and I'm going to make up this. I'm going to make up this prayer. Do you know that you've got a river of life flowing out of you that makes the lame to walk and the blind to see, that opens prison doors and sets the captives free? You've got a river of life flowing out of you. If the Holy Spirit lives within you, the Holy Spirit wants to get out. And the Holy Spirit wants to set little kids that are already captive, wants to set them free. Could be by your smile, could be by your, this arm around their shoulder or somebody that believes in them. You have the Holy Spirit living within you. And I pray that it will set the captives free, that it will make the lame to walk and the blind to see. You got that? You received that? In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Yeah, thank you. Guess what? That, that goes to every one of us. Uh, you've got a river of life flowing in you. Wasn't that him, that part great? Because it was just straight out of the scripture that we used last week. Straight out. And you might thought it was radical in the scripture, but like you just sang it. You've got a river of life that will change people's lives. Uh, there's more nuggets today in the scriptures. You ready to dig in? God's got a word for you. This will be as practical as you can possibly get. We want to mine the words. We want to like, we're getting in a mine and we're throwing out all the, all the gravel and we're looking for the nuggets uh, here today. So we're in Matthew chapter 25 today. Matthew chapter 25 verses 14 uh, through 30. So it's up on the screen. It's even better if you can use it right out of your scriptures and you can make points and put it right in the columns. But it says, again, now if you were just, you know, if you're just caught in the middle of a conversation and somebody says, well, again, wouldn't you want to ask them like, hey, like what would you say before that you're saying again to? If you go right back up in this passage, the again is he just taught the same thing over and over and over again. Isn't Jesus great? Like he just preached the same sermon over and over again. Here was his again. The kingdom of heaven is like. Do you want to know what heaven is like? This passage is going to tell you. We need to know what heaven is like. Here are some things you've been taught about heaven. You've been taught that when somebody uh, dies and goes to heaven, they become an angel. That's not true. <laughs> they stay a human, okay? Um, angels are angels. Humans are humans. Uh, people don't die and become angels up in heaven. You've been taught like streets of gold and, and all those things. That's true. There's, a, uh, there's streets of gold. But here is something that we most of us think about heaven that I think is, is really not true. Heaven is not a future reality, but can be present right now. You don't have to wait to die to go to heaven. Can I say it again? You don't have to wait to die until you go to heaven. We should be going, yes. <laughs> you know, wouldn't that be like, wouldn't you love to live heaven on earth? Wouldn't you love to live the way God's called us to live on earth? We say things like, thy kingdom come in heaven. Uh, or as it is in heaven. We can pray for that right now and we can walk in that. Here's going to be a principle. Like you want heaven on earth, we're going to dig into it and find it. Now it says again, it will be like a man going on a journey. Now when Jesus was teaching this the first time, all of his people would go, oh, we get what he's saying. You do, you're not doing that, but they would do it. It would be like if I would say, Three men walked into a bar. <laughs> you got it? Like you, you, you immediately, you, go, you relax and you go, okay, what's coming? A joke's coming, right? Um, three men walked into a bar. No, really, they did. You know? No, no, you know it's a joke. You know not to go, well, were there four? Which bar were they going to? You just relax and listen to the story. What are you listening for when you hear a story like that? Three men walked into a bar. You're waiting for the punchline. Um, a horse walked into a bar. The bartender said, why the long face? <laughs> you got it, you know. Uh, it, it may be, there, when, there, when Jesus is teaching like this, wait for the punchline. So let's just go through this. We'll be like a man going on a journey. 
This is what heaven will be like. It will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. Whose wealth was it? It was the man's wealth. It wasn't the servant's wealth. It was the man's wealth. That's a key part to this. To one he gave five bags of gold. To another, two bags. And to another, one bag. Those bags, uh, they, the, the original language, they call them talents. Um, you know, we get our, our idea of talents, that each one of us get these natural gifts, these talents that come from God. It's, we get it from this passage. Uh, to one, he gave five talents, two talents, and one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with the two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received the one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. So we get the story. There's three people, just like three men walked into a bar. Two of them uh, live one way. Another lives another way. Notice that each one of them got a different amount. Again, who's the stuff belong to? It belongs to God. Everything belongs to God. I want you to make a list of everything that you have. Everything that you have in life. Make a li- go, go through your inventory of stuff that you have in your garage. Make a list of stuff that you have in your house, in your life. I want you to make a list of everything that you have that's come from God. Then I want you to make a list of everything that you got on your own. You know, like you worked for, you got it. Like this is God's stuff that he gave me, and this is my stuff. Can you make that list? Guess what? There's nothing in this list. It's all God's. Absolutely everything belongs to God. Everything belongs to God. As we move on, he says, After a long time, the master of these servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. The master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, You entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man. Harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvested where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers. So that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth." Well, Jesus, good sermon. <laughs> great story. Great, great, great punchline there, right? Let's look at the punchline for a second. Now, th- these are, this is directly from the words of Jesus. I'm not making this up. It's not just even what, what the people in the Bible made. This is directly the words of Jesus. He tells this story. Two of them receive about the best compliment from Jesus you can possibly get. How many of you would love to stand before God one day and say, ha- have God say to you, well done, good and faithful servant? 
like, is, that's the mission statement of so many people. Like, that's what they want. They want to hear those words. I want to live the life that I can one day hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, can anyone think of a worse um, condemnation than what was said to the last servant? Can you imagine what it would feel like to hear Jesus say to you, you wicked, lazy servant? This is the contrast of the passage. The one is the greatest compliment you can get from God, and the other is the worst condemnation that you can get from God. So what's the difference in the way the two lived? The first two lived in what kind of way? They took what God had given them and they used it. The third one takes what God had given to them and what they do? They hid it. That person hid it and didn't use it. So here's something I know about you. I, I know this about you because I know this about me. It is so easy in life to take ownership of things and actually to collect things and own things you will never use. You'll never use again. Anybody ever done that? Like, you've got stuff you know you'll never use again. That's the danger of the passage. That's what happened with the third one. You own stuff, but you're not going to use it. That's the way we live on earth. That's the human tendency of what we do on earth is to, to buy things we don't even want to impress people we don't even like. You ever done that in life? Like you bought something like, well, I really didn't want that, but everybody else had one, so I guess I better have it. Um, if you don't believe this, like my, my son that's 10 years old even gets this. Last night, uh, he was in our living room riding around on his hoverboard that he spent absolutely every penny that he owns to try to buy, um, riding around on his hoverboard, it says these nuggets of words. Um, isn't it interesting that, uh, that people in a fad, they buy things, and it's, it's so much harder to enjoy something when, when nobody else enjoys it any longer. <laughs> Again, he's riding around on his hoverboard. Uh, like, like, isn't it... So, Here's the thing about a fad. You buy something because, and this is what he's talking about. I buy something that everybody else wants because I think I might need it someday. Does anybody ever have a fidget spinner? They bought these because what's the fidget spinner do? A fidget spinner, this, this is how they sold it. Like a fidget spinner will take a distracted kid and focus them. And if, do you know how many fidget spinners it takes to focus a child? You know, like one doesn't do it. You know, he just kept buying them. And like anytime we went to the store, he's like, I got to have a fidget spinner and patriotic fidget spinner. And then, uh, you know, there's this one, you know, it's just got fidget spinner after fidget spinner. And uh, do you know where they are? Up in his room, hidden in this old antique thing. Like he doesn't use it. Do you know why they're not fun any longer? Because nobody else likes them any longer. And when everybody else stopped liking them, it's kind of worthless to me. Well, that's just a 10-year-old. Only 10-year-olds do that, right? <laughs> Have you ever bought something that you, you really don't use any longer? And the primary reason why you don't use it any longer is because other people don't like it any longer. Maybe you still do. Maybe you love it. It's, it's trying to own something we'll never use. So you really will never use a pickup truck, but you got to own one. <laughs> like I know I can't, I don't like use, use them, but man, everybody else has got one, so I, I need one right now. Have you ever bought something that you, just because everybody else had it, this is kind of what happens is we own something, but don't use it. Begin to go through your closets. Is there anything in your closets that you stop using? And maybe you stop using because it's just gone out of style. Isn't that the same thing? It's, it's, it stopped being appreciated by everybody else. You know, what if you went through your closets and just looked for the things that you haven't used recently? And if you haven't used it, to get it to somebody who will use it. 
Because this passage is really about owning stuff we don't use is dangerous. If we own something, have control of it, store it, keep it, hold on to it, but don't use it, it does something to us. And that something is really not good. So we, we have things, and, and uh, this ownership myth is, is so important. I have a friend that owns a, a, a national chain of a hardware store. I'll just say it. He owns an Ace Hardware store. Um, and I've, I know the family really, really well to know that when they bought this hardware store and started it and got it going, after several years, the, the management from Ace came and sat down in their home and said, your hardware's not doing too good. We recommend that you shut this thing down. Can you imagine the pain of the family? They heard this and everything. And at that moment, they just gave up their hardware to God and just gave it to him. Said, God, it belongs to you. You can do with it whatever you want to do. And now, it's one of the most productive, fruitful um, Ace Hardwares in the Midwest. Um, well, I tell that story not because of just that part, but this man, I'm meeting with him this week, and, and what he said was, is that this young buck comes in, and he's uh, making a website for their hardware, and they put their stuff on social media and all of this, and generating business, and he has no idea how it happens. He just, he just sells nuts and bolts. And this guy came up to him and said, uh, I need to get your picture to put on the website uh, as the owner of the hardware. And he said, wait, wait, wait a minute. I am not the owner of this hardware. He said, well, yes, you are. And he said, I had the hardest time trying to explain to this young guy that I didn't own the hardware store. God owned the hardware store, and I was just running it. And the, the kid said, well, like, if you don't own it, like, like what, what kind of name do we put down for you? And he said, I don't care what name you put down for me, but I refuse to have you put owner. I think it would be great if you and I began to say the same thing, if we began to look around and say, what is it that I have put the name owner of myself on this? And, and you know what? It's just caused stress in my life. And just to recognize that God is the owner. Someone came up to me after the first service and said to me, if you can't share it with somebody else, then you shouldn't have it. Oh, isn't that great? Like the... Like when we won't share something, that's a sign that we've become owner of it. Uh, my daughter Hannah's uh, moving into an apartment where uh, we, we launched our fourth kid this week. Isn't that, that's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. <laughs> Brought a tear to us when we went up to her room and like, oh, wow, this is a little different. We got over it really fast. I uh, want, want you to know. Um, but... One of the things, she, she needed a dining room table, and we've got one down in our basement. And uh, it hasn't been used for, for several years. It's been down in our basement. She's like, can I, can I borrow the dining room table? Now, this, this thing is special. When our kids were really little, they sat around that table. Like, it means so much to us. When I was little, I sat around the same table. When my dad was little... He sat around the same table. So my dad at one point gives it to me, and like we have it. I know this means so much to her. And, and I said, well, like you can have it in your apartment, but it's ours. It's ours, <laughs> you know, like that trying to, trying to hold on to something. Have you ever been in that place? We, we own it. We own it, but don't use it, and it's such a dangerous place to be in. So what's... What are we supposed to do? You know what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to radically use things that we don't own. Like we're to radically, and I use that word radically because that radically is so important for us to understand. This is not to be timid. This is to boldly use what God has given us in any kind of form that what God has given us. Because it's fear that keeps us from using the stuff God entrusts us with. It's fear that made the guy hide it, and it's fear that makes us hold on to it. We've got to release it and, and get rid of the fear and saying, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm getting rid of this stuff. 
uh, this past week, uh, yesterday, Isaac was uh, walking by. Uh, we have an old, old pickup truck uh, that's been restored and everything. And I came in the driveway, and he's riding around out front, and he goes, uh, Dad, I scratched your truck. And I gulped. Um, it's not the first time he scratched my truck. He scratched my truck many, many times. Um, but this is the first time, like every time I give him the same lecture, like, if you scratch it, come tell me. You won't get in trouble if you tell me. You will get in trouble if I find it and you didn't tell me about it. So, like, he immediately comes and tells me he scratched my truck. And, I, and I'm gulping and I'm saying, Isaac, I just want you to know I'm so proud that you told me. But don't get near my truck again, you know. Like, <laughs> like go out another door. Do, do something else. And I know this. I absolutely know this. That that truck is going to is going to end up in a junkyard one day. It's gonna. But Isaac is going to last for all of eternity. I even know this. I know this that in several years I'm going to walk by the scratch and I'm going to be glad it's there because I'm going to remember this moment. I know that. I know that. I know that. But why is it that we hold on to this stuff? What has God given you that you can still use? What has God given you that you need to get it into the hands of somebody that can use it? There's a man in our church. His name is Al. I met him today. He's 97 years old. I went up to him, and as I was greeting him, got down on one knee in front of him, and somebody whispered like over, they said, Al was in World War II. I'm telling you, any time I hear those words that somebody was in World War II, I'm not moving on. I'm trying to get out of that person anything I can possibly get. Where, where did you serve? What was it like? And just really briefly, he said to me, I was in Japan when the treaty was signed. Wouldn't you love to hear that story? I've got to make an appointment I, I, to find that. Like, I've got to find out this story. You know what? Al's 97 years old. He's still alive. You tell me what he has. He has a story that needs to be told. That's what God's given him. Perhaps you've got a story that needs to be told. Maybe you've got a table that needs to be used. Maybe you've got a broken heart that needs to be shared. Maybe you've got some experience that you need to teach. But everybody's got something. Everybody's got something. You might be comparing yourself to the other people and say, well, they got more than I got. Um, I was with a guy this week, and we looked at a house, and he said, wow, if I lived in that house, I'd have to text my wife to find out where she was at. <laughs> maybe you've got rooms that you don't even use. Like Maybe you've got cars that you don't even use. It is a dangerous thing to own something that we don't use. But I'm telling you, it's the most exhilarating thing in the world to be able to share something that you don't own, to use something that you don't own. And in fact, Jesus said, you want to know what heaven is like? There will be people that will get to the last day of their life and they will be holding on so tightly to something that they can't keep. And then there are going to be others that get to the last moment of their life and they're going to be just absolutely free giving away things that they could never own. <laughs> Jim Elliott, a martyred missionary, said this, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Because those are people that are already living in heaven. Those are people that you can't kill because they're going to live on forever. And so I simply ask you today, are you owning stuff that you're not using? Or are you using stuff that you'll never own? So God, today we pray for this shift. We want to live in your kingdom. We want your kingdom to come and your will to be done. And we thank you in this parable that you socked us right between the eyes. And you gave us the greatest nugget that we can live by. God, I pray 
that we could release the stuff that we could never hold on to. Just release it in the name of Jesus to him. Cast it at, on the, cast it at his feet today and say it belongs to you. But here's my challenge. Can you use it? If you still got it, if you've got breath, can you use it? If you can still walk, walk. If you can still share, share. If you've got something that needs to be taught, teach it. If you've got something that needs to be given away, give it away. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, can I just tell you one little thing that I, that's a help? I get it that you're going to walk in your closet and there's something that you can't let go of because it's got a memory attached with it. Like, I still got in my closet the wedding socks that I wore. Like, they're white. Where do you wear them? You know, I'll never use them again, but what do you do with them? Um, we've got, somebody made us a quilt, and it was a quilt that, can, it's the shirt that I first went on a date with my wife. It was a shirt that, um, like, when kids were born, that's the shirt I was wearing. <laughs> Like, how do you give that to goodwill? Um, like, maybe you could make something out of it so you could keep the memory, but still use it. And there's something wonderful about being wrapped up in memories. That, that's a great thing. Maybe there's something that you just need to take a picture of and then give it away. Maybe you could give it away to somebody that you could visit them um, and still see it, but you're seeing it in use. Think of some way, even if it's a memory, Maybe it's letting go of a memory here today. So let's stand together and worship him and let's be free to let go here today.